welcome to this Living Well webinar on myeloma and cognition. Um, I, I, my name's Ellen, I'm one of the nurses here at Myeloma UK, so my main job is to answer our free phone helpline, the Myeloma Infoline. So I speak to many patients and families every day on the helpline um, and answer questions about treatment and, um, and, and many of those questions are on cognition or, or the, the problems that can arise um, when there are cognitive issues. So in this web webinar I'll do my best to describe what cognition means, the types of issues patients may face, why cognitive problems can occur in myeloma, as well as talking about how to cope with some, uh, and some uh, self-management suggestions as well. So uh, cognition relates to the capacity of our brain to think, to understand, to learn, plan and remember. Often if there are any issues with cognition, patients and their loved ones use the term chemo brain. I'm sure this is something that many of you will have heard of. Whilst this isn't perhaps a particularly accurate description, there is likely more to it. Um, it's a term that many people use to describe their symptoms. Cognitive dysfunction is something that's been noted in patients with hematological malignancies such as myeloma for over 20 years. So looking at the problems that some patients may face, um, some of the symptoms uh, patients may experience if there's been any cognitive impairment might include poor memory. Uh, sometimes it takes longer to remember someone's name, for instance, or they may forget appointments. An inability to concentrate. Patients often describe feeling muddled or f have foggy thinking. And many have poor executive function. Executive function refers to the ability to strategize, plan and organize. Older patients may be more likely to have psychomotor function issues. This refers to simple actions where the brain and other parts of the body need to communicate, such as for driving, making a cup of tea or fastening buttons, for instance. Many patients and their loved ones say that these symptoms can be very frustrating and this is understandable. We get used to being at a certain level cognitively day to day and we do notice if this changes at all. More often than not, if there are days when we feel less on the ball cognitively, we can put it down to an event such as feeling groggy after a poor night's sleep or not being able to concentrate too well if there's a lot on our mind. However, if these symptoms occur suddenly, or if they're severe or continue for a length of time, it's important to report them to your doctor or nurse specialist, as there may be more to it. So there are a number of reasons that myeloma patients specifically experience a cognitive decline, and this list that you see uh, on this slide suggests what may contribute to it. Myeloma itself can cause some symptoms of cognitive disturbance, for instance, patients who have high calcium levels can experience confusion and disorientation. Infection as well can cause feelings of confusion and disorientation. We know that anemia commonly causes fatigue, which can lead to slow thinking, a lack of concentration and generally feeling quite muddled. Even mild anemia can cause a reduced ability to think straight, to gather thoughts and to concentrate. Emotional and psychological issues, such as stress and anxiety, can certainly have a negative effect on cognition. It's very common for patients to feel overwhelmed at various stages in their myeloma journey, especially at diagnosis, relapse, or when starting new treatment. It's normal for short periods of stress to impair cognition briefly. However, a myeloma diagnosis sets up a course of stress-filled events which can continue over long periods and this can lead to depression, a loss of confidence and can, can have a negative impact on quality of life. The drugs used to treat myeloma as well as some of the supportive treatments do also have a part to play. Some studies have shown that patients do experience a decline in cognitive function after initial treatment and this can be exacerbated following high dose therapy and stem cell transplantation for instance. Most patients will experience a decline in fo cognitive function about, for about one to three months after their stem cell transplant. 
and it does appear to resolve after about 6 to 12 months. However, unfortunately, a small number of patients may notice a continued mild impairment. Of course, further studies would be needed uh, and would certainly help to identify any links or risks. We also know that specifically steroids and thalidomide can cause decline in cognitive function. Thalidomide does have sedative properties and whilst it can help those uh, on it perhaps have a good night's sleep, they do often wake up somewhat groggy uh, and many would describe it as feeling a little hungover. We know that steroids are known to cause mood swings, irritability, poor concentration and agitation. I'll go into this um, a little more on, on the next slide. Other factors which might contribute to an increased risk of cognitive impairment would include age. There's a normal level of cognitive decline as we age. Sleep is also very important. Sleep helps cement memories and learning. If there's any significant sleep disruption, this can affect daytime ability to concentrate and to remember. And of course, any previous impairment would also increase the risk of further decline. Some other major illnesses may also have an effect on cognition, such as heart disease and diabetes, for instance. It's also worth remem remembering that not everything that happens following a my myeloma diagnosis is necessarily related to the myeloma. So patients can develop other illnesses and a decline in cognitive function out of the blue for no apparent reason may prompt investigations for, for dementia or, or Alzheimer's, for instance. I've heard many times on the end line that the, the, the mood swings caused by steroids is one side effect which can cause the most upset. They can be quite severe and can change temporarily someone's character, making them angry, irritable and quick to have outbursts of bad temper. This can be more upsetting perhaps for carers and family members. Patients may not even notice that they are behaving unreasonably. One thing to mention here is that because steroids can cause poor concentration, then patients should be careful about driving when on them. A patient told me recently at the Leeds Info Day that his wife told him she was very worried about him driving in an altered mental state. And whilst he hadn't given it much thought until then, after that he was very careful not to drive if his wife said she was concerned that he was not as capable when on steroids. Of course, not everyone sees this in a negative way. Some patients quite like the boost of energy they get when they're on steroids. They get lots done and they're kept very busy. And it's often the dip in mood when the steroids are finished that can, that can be more worrying. So here are a few things that patients who've been affected by cognitive decline have said. I'm sure many of you will relate to, to some or all of these. It's worth remembering that all treatments have the potential for causing side effects, but like everything to do with myeloma, these can vary from person to person. This is why it's quite important to be vigilant and to report anything that you think might be a side effect of the treatment you're on. It's also worth remembering that there is much that can be done to get the balance between getting on top of your myeloma and managing any side effects treatment may cause. So please don't suffer in silence. Quality of life is something that's taken very seriously and if you're feeling rubbish then your healthcare team will want to know about it and will try their very best to improve the situation. So we'll now look at some coping strategies. It's often a good idea to keep a diary anyway to keep on top of all of the contact details and appointments necessary day to day but if you're experiencing cognitive issues it's absolutely a good idea. Some patients prefer to put all their appointments into their phone's calendar, set a reminder to themselves. This helps ensure that they don't miss anything. Setting alarms can help to ensure that you don't miss or forget about the important things. Perhaps writing a to-do list would be useful and I would suggest it's best to concentrate on one task at a time. Too many things going on will only complicate things further. Some patients tell us that doing crosswords, playing Scrabble, taking part in social activities or doing quizzes helps to keep them sharp. But physical exercise, as I mentioned in the fatigue webinar, can certainly help reduce fatigue and the grogginess it can cause. So, it's, so if possible, do try to take regular gentle exercise. It's a good idea. 
If anxiety is causing you to feel overwhelmed, and this is something we hear all the time, then there are counsellors available. If you feel that this is affecting you, then please do ask to be referred to a clinical psychologist by your doctor or nurse specialist. Many patients also tell us that chatting to others, sharing experiences helps. So if you've got access to the internet, you might find the discussion forum on our website helpful. There's also a closed Facebook page where um, patients and families chat to each other, share experiences, um, and it's, uh, many, many do tell us that they find this very helpful. Ask family members and loved ones to be patient. I'm sure they will understand, but they may not be aware that you're struggling if you don't tell them. As with all things, please be vigilant and report any changes or worrying symptoms to your doctor or nurse. There may be something that can be done to help. At Myeloma UK we have a range of resources which you, which you might find helpful. Our Living Well with Essential Guide looks at the day-to-day -day practicalities of living with a diagnosis of myeloma. We have a wee booklet, um, it's a lovely wee booklet called uh, The Small Things That Make All The Difference. It's a very popular wee booklet and it's full of helpful quotes from patients, carers, families, friends. And these are genuine quotes from, from people, they're not just things that we've made up. Um, it's a popular wee book, it always um, it gets flo flown off the shelves at Info Days, I'm, I'm aware of that. And it's also helpful to make a list of questions to take with you when you go to see your doctor. Um, uh, that's one of the, the quotes from this wee booklet that I use regularly on the info line. And we also have publications about the specific um, issues, uh, fatigue and myeloma is a booklet that's uh, uh, very useful. And we have an information sheet on steroids which um, goes into depth about the, um, the side effects of steroids. So um, if you feel that talking to someone else, sharing your experiences, listening to what others have to say, then do have a look at our discussion forum uh, on our website. You can access it, it from the home page um, and um, you can access it from there. And there are various sections on the discussion forum. There's a section for newcomers, there's a section for general issues about myeloma, there's a section where patients talk about treatment and side effects. Um, and there's a section specifically where carers can chat to each other. Um, so do have a look at that. And as I say, the closed Facebook page is set up by a patient, so it's not um, something that we have direct control of, although I am one of the admins, and uh, if you want to join that, um, then it's, it's a very, very busy Facebook page, and it's a closed one, so um, you get some um, privacy that way too. So now I'm going to try and answer your questions as best as I can. Um, so please bear in mind that I can't see your medical notes. Um, um, I'm not a doctor, I'm not your haematologist, but I will do my best to answer any questions that you have in, in general terms. Absolutely, okay, thanks for that, Ellen. Um, that was a really great presentation and I think that it, it covers the basics really well. What, what we're going to do now is uh, have some questions. Okay, so let's um, let's get the first question up then, which we had in just before the webinar started from Susan, um, who asks, um, if someone with myeloma has been on treatment for a long time, are there any possibility? Is there any possibility that there can be irreversible damage to the brain? Oh, that's a good question, Susan, um, and I'm not sure if I'm honest. Uh, certainly, often as with all side effects of treatment, the effects can be cumulative, so it makes sense that the longer you're on a treatment, the more likely you are to have side effects. And if those side effects are um, a feeling of, of grogginess or a feeling of you know, cognitive dysfunction, then, then that does make some sense. I, I would like to think that um, you know, when you're off treatment, myeloma treatment you know, as we've said often times in the past, myeloma is a relapse and a remitting cancer. So often patients are only on treatment for chunks of time. Um, so the periods that you're off treatment, I would like to think that things do improve quite drastically. And if they don't, do speak to your doctor about that. Um, but I guess if uh, someone's had myeloma for a very long time, if they've been on lots and lots of different treatments, then, then I guess sometimes the effects can be cumulative. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's let's move on to the next question, which is from James. Um, now, James says, um, 
that he assumed his muddlement was all because of treatments. I feel much better in myself when not on treatment, but very muddled when on it. Do you think it might be partly psychosomatic? Well, it's possible, of course, and if you've associated that in your mind with, with how you feel, then it, it, it absolutely may be possible. And of course, anxiety um, does play a big part. And, and when you're on treatment, there are, there are a whole range of anxieties that you may feel. Um, so, so that may play a part as well. Um, I, I suspect that how what you feel is absolutely very genuine and you're feeling what you're feeling and, and no one can say different. Um, but I, I likely think that the, the, the treatment is probably a combination of those things, if I'm honest, James. And yes, you may well um, have been thinking long and hard about it and, and are very anxious about it but the treatment may have an effect as well if you're on any sort of steroids at all, if you're on thalidomide, if you're on treatment that can cause a bit of cognitive impairment, then absolutely the treatments are the biggest culprit at that point. But if you're thinking about it uh, and that's making you more anxious, then that will have a part to play for sure. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, and the next question comes from... Margaret, who says, are cognitive issues because of brain damage or just a temporary or passing side effect? I absolutely wouldn't think it was due to brain damage. Um, no. Um, if there's any brain damage going on, then we're thinking more of something like Alzheimer's or dementia. And as I said earlier, you know, just because you've got myeloma, it doesn't mean to say that everything that happens to you from then on in is related to the myeloma or its treatment. People as they age do decline cognitively. People do develop other issues like dementia. So, um, no, I wouldn't like to think that there's actual brain damage caused. Um, that's, 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 no, I wouldn't like to think that that happened and I'm sure it doesn't, no. Okay, and um, the next question then is from Stuart, who says, would activities like board games, puzz quizzes, etc. count as brain exercises, or is it more about puzzles that you can do every day? I'm not sure what specifically what type of brain exercises are best, um, but, but certainly we do know, and patients do tell us, that, that they do feel sharper if they do regular um exercises where they are using their brain, they are thinking about things, um, so uh, Sudoku, uh, Scrabble, um, chess, you know, anything where you're, you're having to think about things in, in an order certainly would help and, you know, anecdotally that's what we hear as well, so I'm not sure which is best, but, um, but certainly doing something r uh, rather than doing nothing is a good idea, absolutely. And, and physical exercise as well, as I've said, physical exercise, and this is something that has been researched, physical exercise does help with fatigue, and fatigue certainly can cause you to feel muddled and groggy and, and not quite yourself. Okay, and there's, a, there's another similar question, I guess, on, on brain exercise, um, so let me just find that one. It's just come in um, from Steve, who says, would you recommend studying as a coping strategy, for example, picking up a university course initial street treatment gosh that's that would be that yeah a, a, a why not and if that's something you want to do if it's something that's a, that's that, that's been in your plans to do um, it's always a good idea to have goals and plans for lots of reasons it helps your feelings of self-esteem and your feelings of, of well-being so if doing a, a course at university is something that you you've always wanted to do then why not I would um, put in a wee note of caution that you perhaps don't take on too much because that can make things worse. If you've got a, a hundred things going on, if you're on treatment, if you're, you know, if you're still working perhaps, if you've got so many things going on in your life, it can make things worse. But if it's something that you've planned, if you've set aside time to do it and you feel that it's not going to, to do that, then Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Keep your brain sharp, do some studying. Um, I think that's an excellent idea, but just be a bit wary that you're not taking on too much, I think. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, we've had um, a good number of questions in. Please do um, keep sending them in if you've got one, or maybe one of the other questions that have come in and sparked something off for you. Um, this question is from Jim, who says, is Velcade bad for causing um, chemo brain? And I wonder, Ellen, if you could actually maybe talk about some of the various drugs and how different ones do or don't cause yeah. this effect. I haven't heard that Velcade is a particular culprit, I have to say. Um, I can't think why Velcade would, would cause chemo brain or a decline in cognition. Um, the biggest culprits are, are the steroids. Yeah, they can cause absolute, quite severe mood swings, irritability, and um, th those are the ones we hear about mostly. Thalidomide, certainly, when it was used all those years ago in the 50s um, for, for pregnant women, it, it was used because it has quite a big sedative effect. And any sedative can make us feel a bit dull in thinking, a bit groggy. Um, and that's why patients take thalidomide about an hour or two before they go to bed. Um, and then hopefully the effects will have worn off by morning um, and they'll have had a good night's sleep because of that. However, some patients do feel a bit, um, a bit groggy um, the day after uh, thalidomide. It's a bit of a hangover type effect, as I said. Um, those are probably the biggest culprits. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any others. And of course, because the, um, uh, the, the newer versions of thalidomide, the, um, the lenalidomide, the pomalidomide, these are all uh, sons and daughters of, of thalidomide. Um, it makes sense that they may well have that. It's probably a less of a risk with these drugs because they are further developed. Newer versions of, th of thalidomide um, are made to be more potent with less side effects. But it makes sense that they may well have a, a slight risk of that. Um, chemotherapy itself, chemotherapy is used, high dose chemotherapy prior to stem cell transplant. I haven't seen the, the evidence that that specifically um, affects cognition, but we know that there is evidence that um, stem cell transplant in itself and it may be a combination of the treatment and the whole anxiety of going through quite a tough procedure there's a, a, a stem cell transplant is a, a major event in your life um, it's quite a traumatic event um, so you know um, I guess in many ways similar to kind of post-traumatic stress disorder so, so that in itself but but no I haven't heard that Belcade specifically um, so it's possibly if you're feeling that way on Velcade, it may be the steroids if you're on those as well, or it may be um, something else. And again, please, please do report it. Don't, don't suffer the silence. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got some other great questions in uh, here. Um, this one is from Carol, um, who says, Thank you, Ellen. My husband is no longer in remission and feels so tired. So I appreciate your, em appreciate your emphasis on gentle exercise. I think depression can add to not wanting to bother with that. Are there any strategies to help? Yes, that's a very good point, Carol. And, and when, you know, when we've said that probably the, the biggest issue is at diagnosis, at relapse, when new treatment options are being discussed, it has a huge psychological impact. And depression, unfortunately, can occur. Um, I mean, there are antidepressants, for instance, do have their place as a temporary measure. They're, they're, they're good drugs. I know a lot of people do worry about taking a whole range of drugs and then taking antidepressants on top. But they have their place. And I would like to think that it would just be a temporary measure. Um, and, of course, when myeloma is active, that's when you're more likely to be anemic. And, and it's the anemia that can cause the fatigue and fatigue absolutely has major uh, cognitive symptoms so yeah if you're if you're feeling very fatigued and if you're feeling very down and you can't be bothered doing gentle exercise then I guess it's just little and often taken each day at a time um, and, and many patients feel as if they're going two steps forward and three steps back but you know, the, 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 the day after may be better than the day before. And talk to people, share your experiences. There absolutely will be someone out there who's felt exactly the same way as your husband's feeling and or who feels that way now. And they may well have 
better coping strategies um, than I can suggest listening to people on the info line. So maybe chat to someone on the discussion forum, join a support group, have a look on the Facebook page, see what others are saying about how they coped. Um, there are lots of different um, ways that people can get get through this day to day and, and he absolutely will. Yeah. Thanks again, Ellen. Um, the next question I think is a, a really good one from Mariana, um, who says, uh, my problem is job interviews, particularly competency-based questions at interviews. I struggle to think on my feet when responding to such questions. It makes me, it takes me much longer to recall specific examples from past experience to demonstrate my competency, yet I can't explain why at the interview. Despite lots of preparation, I end up appearing inept and vague when this isn't the case at all. Any suggestions? Oh, what a shame, Marianne. That sounds awful. I do feel for you. Gosh, it's bad enough um, attending interviews um, at the best of times, so, so that must be very difficult. Um, what could you do to... And, and, and you're doing all the right things, I guess, and, and being very prepared, lots of preparation. Um, Lots of planning, perhaps um, playing it out with family and friends. Um, maybe writing yourself down, you know, bullet points on note cards um, about the, the the most important points that you want to raise. Um, I mean, I guess people who are doing interviews will understand absolutely and realise that people are, are nervous and you know anxiety can, can make you um, a little, bit slower to, to think on your feet. Um, it's, it's quite a, a difficult one, that's quite a specific um, issue there and I wonder if anyone else has, has um, any um, ideas about what Marianne can do to, to help. Um, but I think you are doing all the right things Marianne um, and it is um, uh, difficult to, I mean, you can't see why at the interview, why you're, you're feeling, and I suppose the more you think about it, the worse it gets, and it kind of, it, it roller, um, it kind of gets way out of control, I'm sure, um, it's a bit of a vicious circle, I'm sure, um, I mean, maybe um, some counselling, I know, for instance, that cognitive behavioural therapy helps you to kind of rationalise your thoughts and it allows you to take some control and to take charge of your, your thoughts, you know, reminding you that you're in charge of your, your thoughts and your brain, not, not vice versa. So perhaps having a couple of sessions with a counsellor who specialises in cognitive behavioural therapy, that, that might be something I would suggest. But I do feel your pain, uh, Mariana, it sounds awful. Okay, thanks for that answer, Alan. I think that, that's, that's, um, that's great advice. Um, We've, we've got two here that are very similar, so one from Peter and uh, one from Andy. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll put them both together. Peter says, is there evidence that the myeloma on its own, excluding treatment, can impair cognitive function? And if so, is this worse if the myeloma is more active with high paraprotein counts? Actually, sorry, let's just take that on its own. It's the next two that are together. Okay. So, uh, yes, absolutely. We know that myeloma, and, and that's why sometimes cognitive issues are worse at diagnosis when the myeloma is quite high, when the level of myeloma is quite high and the myeloma is actively causing problems. So there are a couple of reasons for that um, and obviously the higher your paraprotein the more active the myeloma is and we know that myeloma patients are prone to having very high calcium levels in their blood and this is due to bone breakdown. Myeloma causes bones to, to break down down faster than they would normally and that releases calcium into the bloodstream and that high calcium level and, and it's called hypercalcemia you, you've probably heard of it um, can cause you to be disorientated and confused and when I speak to patients on the info line and they say to me that they're feeling disorientated confused or a loved one's feeling disorientated and confused the first thing I always ask is a have they got high calcium or b have they got an infection and again, we know that patients with myeloma, especially if the myeloma is active, are very susceptible to picking up opportunistic infections. And if you've got a, a, a rip-roaring infection going on, then yes, you will be um, cognitively impaired, you will be a bit muddled, you will feel very, um, very groggy. So um, those are probably the two most likely culprits 
in, in the myeloma itself that can cause um, cognitive impairment. Other things can, can as well, for instance, we know that myeloma affects the kidneys and our kidneys um, filter all toxins out of our blood. So if the kidneys aren't working properly um, and you're being left with a level of, of toxins in your blood, that can also have an effect. Um, I'm trying to think what else about the myeloma specifically. Uh, th those are probably the biggest culprits. But yes, Peter, you're absolutely right, the myeloma itself. And, and it's a temporary thing. Once the myeloma's brought under control, patients often notice an improvement, and, and that certainly should happen, yes. Okay, thanks, Alan. So, sorry, it was the, it's these two um, questions now from Andy and from James that are, are very similar. They're both about Revlimid and dexamethasone. So, um, Andy says, I'm just about to start to regime 25 of Rev and Dex maintenance. Do you find Dex affects long-term memory or short-term memory worse? I tend to find short-term memory can be harder on certain days. And just to then uh, say that James's question is about um, Dex and Revlimid and how important is dexamethasone to that um, combination treatment? Yes, um, these are very good questions. Um, I'm not sure about... You certainly, it, it, the dexamethasone is the biggest culprit, absolutely, um, and it can cause short and long term memory issues. Um, I'm not quite sure about the difference between the two, which which is worse, uh, which is made worse. That's that's not something that I'm very sure about. Um, maybe the haematologist would be able to tell you that. Um, and yes, short term memory is is often affected when you're very anxious uh, and when you've got a lot on your mind, if you're starting a new treatment regime, you're worried about taking that, you're worried about side effects, you're worried about your myeloma being brought back under control and you're worried about the what the future might hold. So there's all of these anxieties going on as well. Um, and it's hard to concentrate when you're um, when you're faced with all of that. So um, so certainly short-term memory will be affected and, and you'll find yourself forgetting things um, and and you know that's, that's quite a high dosage of um, of treatment 25 milligrams of revlimid is probably the highest dose and that will you know providing the myeloma is brought under control nicely that that will be reduced um, and there will come a time when your myeloma is at very low very stable levels that the dexamethasone can be stopped to try and answer the next question, can I have a look at that next question, Kyle? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, just to remind myself what James said, yeah, yeah, it, it probably is the dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is a brilliant drug, there's no doubt about it. Um, steroids have many, many uses, not just in, in myeloma or other cancers, but in other health uh, conditions as well. They're used commonly in respiratory conditions, for instance, and um, uh, inflammatory conditions. They're, they're very powerful anti-inflammatory drugs. And they do, it has been shown that they do um, enhance the effects of, of other treatments. So, um, so, so yes, they absolutely have their use and they are used if at all possible. That being said, there are patients who just absolutely cannot tolerate this, the, the dexamethasone. And I do know one or two patients who just don't, don't take them at all because they are affected so severely. Um, as I said earlier, it's really important that you let your doctor know because the steroids can be reduced quite drastically. The dosage can be reduced and the way they're given can be changed. So for instance, instead of getting them in short, sharp bursts, um, you can have them in a, a more tapering, more tapered way. And a lot of patients find that, that they can tolerate it much better then. Um, there is a lot of um, tweaking that can be done to, to help you um, tolerate the, the dexamethasone better. Um, but if at the end of the day your quality of life is such that um, it's, it's not, you know, the, the, the dexamethasone is having a very, very negative effect on it, then some doctors will say, well, we'll, we'll, just, um, we'll just stick with the, the Revlimid. And I know that 
if Revlimid uh, is being used long term, if it's um, being given until the myeloma becomes active again, and that's usually how it's used, after a period of time, I mean, I have spoken to patients on the helpline who've been on Revlimid for two, four, five years even. So after a period of time, the steroids probably will be stopped and you'll be on the lowest dose of Revlimid possible and your quality of life should be much, much better and, and that should be just keeping on top of your myeloma. Thanks, Ellen. So there's, there's um, one more question we're going to take. There was a few more questions that have come in and as they're not quite really on the topic of cognition, um, I've, I've said to people that we can get Ellen to follow up afterwards on those. We'll just stick to cognition for this um, session. Um, so that there's one more question, but if there's any more questions that you have, then please send them in now and I can just add them in. Um, so let's go to the final question unless there's um, some others that come in. So um, this one's quite a difficult one, I think. So um, they say, uh, my husband is on low dose Revlimid and steroids. He has been on steroids for at least the last 18 months and is very difficult to live with um, regarding mood swings from steroids, as well as other reasons unconnected to myeloma. His treatment is keeping the myeloma down, so I'm reluctant to say anything to his doctors. Is there anything we could do to help in the situation? I know that a lot of people do worry um, that if they mention um, that, that side effects are, are having an effect on them, that the treatment will be stopped. Um, it is a big worry, but it's not always the case. It's not necessary to stop the treatment. Um, as I've said in, in the previous question, um, perhaps the, the dose of the steroids could be reduced further. Uh, for instance, I know patients who are on a tiny, tiny dose of steroids on a weekly basis rather than a bigger dose two, three, four days in a row. Um, but but the, the I mean it may well be that the Revlimid can keep on keep that myeloma very low very stable on its own it certainly is possible um, possibly when your husband first started on the, the the Revlimid and the steroids they both had a really big effect in, in bringing the bulk of the myeloma down but now that things are in a, a bit of a plateau and stable it may be that that, that he could do without the steroids. I mean, I know that that um, the mood swings can be very, very difficult. And as I said earlier, sometimes it is more difficult for the person living with the patient. Sometimes the patient doesn't realise just um, how it's affecting them. So please do mention it. I, I mean, I don't know if you've said to your husband that, he, that this is how he behaves and whether he realises that or not, maybe having that conversation would be a good idea. But, but please do mention it to his doctors um, or, or, the, or take the nurse specialist aside one day at the clinic and, and voice your concerns. Um, you know, carers have a huge um, role to play in, in, in uh, living day to day with myeloma and they sometimes have more of a role than the patient. They've got so much going on in their lives, they've got to deal with um, the patient and their mood swings, um, treatments, keeping on top of appointments, keeping family members up to date. So you as a carer have got so much going on in your life and I'm sure you could do without this as, as well. So um, please do speak to someone. Okay, thanks, Ellen. So that's the end of the questions here. So um, there's just a few things I just want to finish up with saying, especially if there was a question that you sent in that wasn't answered, um, if it wasn't on topic or if, if, if we just didn't get to it, that you can call our Myeloma Info Line um, to speak to Ellen or any of our other uh, Myeloma Information Specialists um, on the numbers on screen now. I'll also include these details in the follow-up email. Um, so don't worry if you don't take a note of them just now, or of course you can find them on our website. Um, our next webinars, as I said earlier on, are um, on caring for some of myeloma, on recovering from a stem cell transplant and holiday planning. You can register for these at myeloma.org.uk forward slash webinars. Um, and we will send out information that Ellen referenced in the uh, presentation um, on that email as well. So there'll be links to these documents. Um, that you can download or print or send by email as well as links to the forum and the uh, Facebook closed support group page. So that's it from us. Thank you very much uh, for attending. We had a good number on this webinar today and um, if there's any other questions feel free to uh, either call the info line or send them in and we hope to see you on the next webinar. Thank you. Bye -bye.